Let's all open up our Bibles. We are looking at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, okay? Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19, all right? Before we go into the passage, I just have a question for you guys this morning. How many of you, how many of you hate it when people do things that you hate, that you don't like? Like you really hate it when people do things that you don't like. Okay, all right, yeah. So we're all pretty much in the same boat. I, if you don't hate it when someone does something that you don't like, there's something wrong with you, okay? Um, or maybe you're just, you're, your gift is like kindness, like true kindness, I don't know. Um, but usually when people do things that we don't like, we really don't like. Um, how many of you guys are the youngest in your families? How many magnes do we have here? Oh, praise God, yeah. We are the revolutionaries, you guys. Magnes rule, okay? So um, one of the giftings, that God has given to the youngest of the family, okay, this is just, I'm speaking from, from the Magnes perspective, all right, one of the giftings that God's given us is the gift of scaring our older brothers and sisters, okay, um, it's just a gift that God has given to us, and I practiced this all my life, um, it was just something that came, it was very innate, uh, whenever I saw any of my sisters all by themselves, I would creep up behind them, I would scare them, Wah! You know, ah, you know, oh, Josh, what's wrong with you? Um, and I do the same now with my wife. Uh, my wife is a middle child, but I'm the youngest. And I still have that in me where I like to, you know, like scare her sometimes when she's like doing the dishes and she's like lost because music's playing. And I like creep up out of the room and I'm like, oh, ah, you know, she's like, ah, you know, she screams and I'm laughing and she's like, hey, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, Nampyeon, this is horrible. We're not going to live long. Um, <laughs> Things like that. So that's something that my wife doesn't like. Okay. Now, I got permission to share with you guys what my wife hates. Okay. She doesn't like it when I scare her. But something that my wife, she just detests this like wholeheartedly is whenever I touch my smartphone while I'm driving. If I'm, I, ooh, if I'm driving... And I like want to play music, or if something a notification comes and it's like one of the book signings or something, I'm like, oh, I gotta look at this, and I'm like, manzuing my phone. She hits me <laughs> every time. Ow, ow, stop abusing me. Well, stop touching your phone. She hates it. And I learned this the hard way where one day it was a really busy week and there were a lot of messages coming in from a lot of different people. And so I kept on looking at my phone while I was driving. And there were a couple of times, yes, I almost hit something. Um, and, and my wife, she got so upset that she didn't talk to me for like a period of time in that day. Um, and I, I, was so, I was so confused because I was like, oh, it's, it's a busy week. I have things that I need to check and so forth. Um, but to my wife, she hates it. And the reason why she hates it is because uh, it's just people who drive and touch their phone, uh, you're, 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 your chances of getting into an accident jump uh, increasingly. Uh, it goes up increasingly. And so uh, she's always worried that I'm endangering her, that I'm endangering myself, and I'm also endangering the other people and, and bicyclists and, 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 and drivers around me. Um, and so she hates it. This is something that my wife just really, she, it's not just something that she dislikes. Like when I scare her, she's oh, fine. You know, I don't like it, but, you know, Josh is just a goofball. Like what can you do, right? He loves scaring people. But when I touch my phone, that's crossing the line. And when I touch my phone while driving, that's when my wife, she puts up both hands and she's like, I'm not talking to you today. Don't talk to me. You know, it, it's that. It's that like you're sleeping outside today. You know, like things like that. Today, in today's passage, we are going to read about seven things that God completely detests. Seven things that God, as the writer writes in the Bible, it's a very strong word, but it's a writer, that it, the writer uses this word because it's a word that expresses how much God doesn't like these things and so he says these are things that god not only he detests but he hates these things all right god it's not that he just doesn't like it but he hates it and there are seven things that seven particular actions that god detests and so this is what those actions are if you will read with me proverbs chapter 6 verses 16 to 19 let's read it all together in a loud voice ready begin there are six things the lord hates no seven things he detests haughty eyes a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, 
feet that race to do wrong, false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. All right, there are seven things listed here, seven things that God hates, he detests, okay? And so we're just going to go through these one by one, and then I'm going to share a little bit with you uh, why I believe God is, why God tells us these things, why is he telling us a list of what he doesn't like, I thought Christianity wasn't about the do's and the don'ts, and why is this there, and so forth, okay? So uh, I'll share about that a little bit later, but I just want to go through each one uh, with you guys, not too in-depth, but we'll cover each one together, okay? So the first one is what? Haughty eyes, okay? The first one is haughty eyes. What are haughty eyes? Arrogant eyes, okay? It's a prideful person. Uh, The first thing listed that the Lord detests is an arrogant and prideful person. Why? Why do you think this is the first one on the list? You must be humble. You're jumping way ahead, buddy. I, I'll, I'll share that a little bit later, but you're right. because You, want, you must be humble. Uh, that's very true. Uh, but one of the reasons why God begins this is because an arrogant person, a prideful person, you and I, we all have this. If you think you're a humble person and you have no pride, that's pride, okay? Um, All of us have a degree of pride. We all have a degree of arrogance amongst ourselves or about ourselves. The reason why God starts with this is because an arrogant person, you see the condition of their heart. And according to the Bible, a prideful person, the condition of their heart is actually unhealthy. It is not healthy to be a prideful person. It is not healthy to be an arrogant person. This is actually against the heart of God. Um, And the thing is, is everything else on the list that we're going to go through, it actually stems from a person's unhealthy heart. Okay, that's what we're going to see. Um, But God begins with haughty eyes because a person who has this sense of arrogance or pride about them, not even just in most cases, but in every case, their heart is in a very unhealthy condition according to God's word. Uh, This is where it all begins. And that's why in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Solomon writes this. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Everything, Jemyuk, stems from our heart, the condition of our heart. Every good thing and every bad thing comes from a healthy heart or an unhealthy heart. This is where it all begins. And the first thing that God detests amongst his people is a prideful person. He does not like that, okay? The second thing is a lying person tongue all right the second thing that god does not like is a lying tongue someone who distorts the truth someone who takes what is true twists it and makes it an untrue statement god hates this why why do you think god hates a lying tongue in isaiah we are told that our god is the god of truth amen everything that god speaks Everything about God is true. Amen? So God cannot stand in line with something that is not from him. He is not the father of lies. God is the God of truth. We're told that the father of lies is who? Is who? Satan. He likes to twist truth. That's what got us in trouble in the first place with Adam and Eve is because Satan took something that was true. Yes, we were made in the image of God. But then he twisted that truth and he said, Adam and Eve, but you could become God. Not just godly, but you can become God. Don't you want to be God of your life? And they fell into that. And that's how this whole sin thing started. But in John chapter 17, verses 14 to 17, this is Jesus' prayer for us. He's actually praying for us. We weren't even born yet. This is 2,000 years before our birth. Uh, But this is a prayer that Jesus prays for us. He says this. He prays to God. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one, to keep them safe from Satan. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. So make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Jesus' prayer for us is that God would keep us in his truth, that he would sanctify us and make us holy in his truth. Why? Why does Jesus pray this? Because God's truth is the only weapon that you and I have to fight against Satan. 
It's the only way that God protects us from the enemy and his lies. Satan loves to fill us with lies. He loves to grab a hold of us with his lies so that we will become, I don't know, we'll look at ourselves more negatively. He likes to lie so that we'll, we'll think that God isn't there for us, that he doesn't love us, that he doesn't care about us. These are things that Satan loves to do. But Jesus prays this prayer where he says, but God, will you please make your people holy Keep them in your word because your word is truth and that will keep your people safe from the evil one. This is why God is against liars, people who have a lying tongue, who lie about things, who lie to their parents, who lie to others, who lie to people. Like God just can't be a part of that because everything about God is truth. Amen? He is about truth, Jem Youth, not about lies. The father of lies is Satan, not God. And so that's the second thing that God detests. The third thing is hands that kill the innocent. Hands that kill the innocent. Now, this, this one seems a little bit distant from us, okay? Because I'm pretty sure, and I, I want to say that I'm 100% sure, that there is not a single person in this room who has killed someone physically, all right? No one here has committed murder, yes? Okay, all right. Video games don't count, boys, all right? <laughs> I'm not talking about video games. I'm talking about no one here has committed murder. And so this one, the third one, can feel a bit far away from us. But here's the thing. I don't know if you guys know this, but in the Beatitudes, this old, not the Beatitudes, but the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about it. Uh, John, uh, the disciple, also writes about it. And Jesus says, yes, murderers, they have to be uh, judged. They, 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 have, they have to go to court. Um, but if you hate your brother or sister so much like if you continuously hate someone jesus says you've already committed murder in your heart and john the disciple supports this he writes this in first john three fifteen. he writes anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart and here's the thing you guys might be saying oh my gosh that i'm a murderer like i've hated people all my life um here's the thing uh the word hate here is not a one-time hate Okay, if you've like gotten upset at your siblings or you've gotten upset at your parents, this is not the kind of hate that John's talking about. The kind of hate that John and Jesus are talking about, the word is a continuous action, kind of like the asking, seeking, and knocking that we did, right? The aitete, right? Those, those words. Um, it has a very similar ending where it's a continuous hate. When you hate someone continuously, you're already killing them. Pretty much. And one of the things that I think this is really relevant for the 21st century, because I want to connect this third one to now, it does connect. Listen very carefully. Cyberbullying, this is that. This falls under that category. Hands that kill the innocent are those of you who post things about other people, killing their reputation, killing their personhood, killing their self esteem just for your enjoyment. Because we've had cases in the 21st century, in the recent years, where we have had other people around your age committing suicide because of the embarrassment that they've had to face by being exploited online. This is a real issue. The Bible doesn't just talk about murdering physically, but it's also talking about the kind of hatred that we hold sometimes against people and the things that we do against people. God hates that. Why? God is a God who gives life, Jem Youth. He's the one who breathed life into us. Why should we be the ones to stifle that, that life out? We shouldn't. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't stifle someone's life. That's not what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's not what it means to be a child of God. And so hands that kill the innocent Someone who has a constant hatred toward another person, which is equal to committing murder in our hearts, God is against this. The fourth and fifth thing I've kind of put together because they're, they kind of are categorized in the same way. Hearts that plot evil. And the fifth thing is feet that are quick to do wrong. Okay, Feet that are quick, that make haste to do wrong. Um, the fourth and fifth one, it's not just, a, it's not talking about people who plan evil things, all right? Like, 
uh, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, uh, Dr. Evil, if you, I don't know, you guys probably don't even know him. Um, okay, yeah, but it's not about people who plan evil, they're like, oh, yes, I'm going to do this so that this person will get, you know, upset or this person will, you know, get hurt. Oh, yeah, that's, that's an evil plan. No, no, that's not the kind of evil plan that the Bible is talking about. When the Bible talks about a heart that plots evil and feet that are quick to do wrong things, the thing that the Bible is talking about is actually people who do stuff and plan stuff for their own selfish gain. That's evil in God's eyes, actually, if you don't know that. That's what sin is. It's missing the mark. Rather than doing things that, 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 that glorify God, doing things that advantage and are a gain for God, you and I, we fall into this habitual habit of planning things that only benefit me, planning things that only gain for me, planning things and doing things that are just about what I can gain out of this. This is what God is against. It's not just planning evil things, but it's about doing things and planning things for only your gain. You're not even thinking about God's gain. You're not even thinking about God's kingdom. You're not even thinking about the work that God is doing in and through and around you. Everything that you are pursuing is just about you, your gain, what you can get out of it. That is what four and five are. And in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10, at the very beginning of this book, if you guys actually read it, God gives a warning and he says this, my child, if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. Turn your back on them. Why? Because people who plot evil and whose feet are quick to do wrong things, this is what they say. And I'm jumping down to verses 13 and 14. This is what they say. Think of the great things we'll get. We'll fill our houses with all of the stuff we take. Come, throw in your lot with us. We'll share all the loot. Everything here is describing things that we can get, things that we can gain. This is evil in God's eyes because this life is not about our gain. It's about his gain. Amen. Amen. It's about gaining for the kingdom of God so that many more lives might be saved to be with God. It's not about our gain. This life is never about our gain. Everything you and I own, it's a loan to us from God. We're borrowing it because it's not actually ours. You and I, we don't own anything. Everything that we have, all the money that you have, all the possessions that you have, everything that you have is a blessing from God. It is given to us by God. We are not to spend it for our own gain. We have to think about it in light of God's kingdom. How will this advantage God's kingdom? And here's the thing. People who usually plot for their own gain, they hurt people in the process, but they don't care. As long as I get this, whoever else doesn't really benefit from this, they'll just have to live with it. That's the mentality of someone who struggles with numbers four and five, hearts that plot evil and feet that are quick to do wrong. Okay? Number six, a false witness, uh, someone who spreads lies. Now, this is a little bit different from, the, from uh, the second one. The second one is a lying tongue, someone who just has this habit of just lying, like just twisting truth. A false witness is someone who actually speaks falsely about someone else. This is in regard to gossiping and spreading rumors about other people. God detests this. He hates it when you and I talk about other people behind the He hates it when we spread rumors about people, things that we're, we assume this is what's going on, but we're not really sure if it's actually true, but we're assuming it, and so we're going to tell other people about it, and so forth, and that's what we're, that is something that God is against. He is against a false witness. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 1, God tells Moses to tell the Israelites this, you must not pass along false rumors. You must not cooperate with evil people by lying on the witness stand. Spreading rumors about someone is, again, an act of speaking against truth. And God is the God of truth. Amen? Amen? He is the God of truth, not the God of lies. And that is one of my biggest pet peeves, is when people spread rumors about other people without, without knowing the facts or getting their facts straight. I hate that. I hate it when people run on assumptions about other people. Uh, it's the worst thing that we can do. Um, but that is also something that God detests. The seventh and the last abomination in God's eyes is a person who sows discord. 
Okay, a person who sows discord. Jemute, Christ died, he came and he died on the cross so that we could come together in him. If we sow seeds that actually cause people to break up and to split apart, that is against the very thing that God is trying to work towards. He wants to bring people together, not split people apart. And so the person who sows discord, who sows seeds to split people up and to break people up, this is something that God dislikes. He doesn't like it when we do this. And sometimes you guys, I don't know, you might get into this with your friends where you have a friend and another person has a mutual friend, but you want that friend to be on your side rather than to be on the other person's side and so forth. And so you sow these things, you say things, you do things to get that person on your side so that they're not on the other side and you split people apart. Uh, you are working against the kind of work that God is actually trying to work towards is bringing his people together, not separating people, yes. If it was unintended, but you ended up doing that, then you work towards becoming a peacemaker and you try to mend it again. Yeah, yeah. Even if you didn't intend to split people apart, but you accidentally did, you need to accept what you did because you, you were the one that did that. But a person who sows discord uh, is not what God is about. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul writes this, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Amen. Amen. Jem, youth, God desires that we come together, not to be split apart. So these are the seven things that God detests. These are the seven things that God hates. Um, and here's the thing. Many of us, we've probably committed one of these seven. I can tell you for a fact, I have committed all seven of these at some point in my life. Um, there have been moments, seasons in my life where I was very prideful. There have been seasons in my life where I've split people apart. Uh, there have been seasons in my life where I have lied about something. There have been seasons in my life where I have lied about someone. There have been seasons, like especially if I didn't like that person. Uh, there have been seasons in my life where uh, I've hated someone ongoing uh, for a while. I've committed all of these seven. And usually what happens is when you and I, when we fall into one of these seven, what happens is we get into the habit of doing it again. We slip into it again. And some of us, we slip into it because you actually like it. You like gossiping about other people. You love rumors. That's why, you know, those disgusting, uh, uh, what, are, what are those? Those, those, those? those disgusting magazines. I hate looking at those magazines. I don't know why Save on Food sells those. Uh, but those magazines that sell fake news about all the celebrities, like, you know, all, you know, oh, you know, Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt, 50th birthday, but, you know, someone else, and now there's a love triangle. Ooh, you know, they're all fighting. I hate that stuff. I, I, I hate it. I, I don't know why they have it. It's like always in your face whenever you like check out, you know, you know, with your with your groceries and stuff. I hate those 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 those. What is it? Magazines. Oh, chinchashiro. I, I really dislike those because they're not true. And they spread all of these rumors that are not supposed to be, uh, but they do. And it, it's, it's just so bad uh, that, 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 that these people do this. But the world loves these things. People feed off of this stuff. And you and I, sometimes we feed off of this stuff. And then that lie with another lie, and then it keeps on going until obviously everything gets exposed, and then I have to take the brunt of it. It's a stressful life. But if no one's ever tried to correct you, you just get into the habit of saying that over and over and over and over again. And so what happens is in the Christian life, if you get into a habit of doing these things or you like these things, and then you hear someone like me, a pastor, talking about God doesn't like it when you do these things. And you hear this and you're like, oh, gosh, well, I'm like, I'm like heavy into that. You know, like number three, that's a dude. I murder people all the time. Again, not video games. All right. But like, I hate people all the time. Like I hate on everyone. Like anyone who doesn't do what I like, I hate on them, you know. It makes you walk on eggshells in your Christian walk. And then you're always watching your back. And you're always having this fear of like, oh, man, but I'm doing these things. And I don't know uh, it, what, what my pastor will think of me. I don't know what my church friends will think of me. I don't know what my leader will think of me. I don't know what my parents will think of me. I don't even know how, what God thinks of me. Like, he probably thinks that I'm disgusting, I don't know, that I'm stuck in this and so forth. And you and I, we can get lost down that rabbit hole. But here's the thing, Jem Youth, and this is what I want to close with today. The reason why I believe God shares these seven things with us, it is not so that you and I will be focused on those seven things. 
The reason why I believe God shares these things with us is so that you and I will come to realize, okay, if this is what God doesn't like, then what does he like? What does God love? If these are the things that God hates, then what are the things that God loves? And when you think about what God loves, it actually helps you to not focus on the things that he doesn't like. Um, I don't know if you guys have been reading with us through the, 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 um, the Purpose Driven Life, but there's a section in the Purpose Driven Life where Rick Warren talks about you and I, the Bible never says that we are supposed to fight against temptation. We're supposed to fight the good fight, but the Bible never says to, to fight against temptation because you and I, when we fight against temptation, we want to do it more. There's this weird, weird human instinct where when someone tells us not to do something, we want to do it. Don't touch that. You're going to burn yourself. Oh, I just want to try. See, well, you know, like how, how much will it burn me, right? Like you just want to do it. If you keep fighting that temptation, you're so curious. We're like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a very dumb part of our human nature, but that's what happens. But rather than fighting the temptation, Rick Warren, he says, rather than trying to fight the temptation as Christians, all we're supposed to do is we're supposed to let the Holy Spirit just switch our focus. It's like turning the channel on, on, uh, on a TV. You guys don't do that anymore. Um, it's, like, it's like changing the website. Rather than scrolling through mindlessly and, and, and numbingly uh, through Facebook, just change the website to something that is actually more beneficial for you, something that will help you to focus on better things something that will help you to focus on the things that actually matter and that are good. And so rather than focusing on what God doesn't like, I believe God shows us this part so that we will say, okay, God, if this is what you don't like, then what do you like? And here's the thing. You and I, we cannot switch from here to here without God's wisdom. In order to move from the place of always being fearful about what we're doing and or what we're doing wrong and what we're doing that God doesn't like and all of that stuff, in order to move from there into a place where we are doing the things that God loves, where we are doing the things that please God's heart, it takes wisdom. And not just any kind of wisdom, but it takes godly wisdom. And that's my takeaway for you today. It is this. Those who choose to seek after God's wisdom will learn to live in a manner that pleases the heart of God. You will. If you will simply choose to seek after God's wisdom, you will learn what pleases God's heart. And rather than always being so negative and, and thinking, oh, man, I'm doing these things, but they're not beneficial to me, and I'm always upsetting God's heart like this sucks, rather than thinking that way, you'll end up with God's wisdom. You'll end up doing things that actually please God's heart. And here's the thing that kind of came to mind. The people that you love, in your life, Jim, you think about it. The people that you love in your life, do you like doing the things that they hate or do you like doing the things that actually please them? You want to please them. Why? Oh, you care about them. You love them. People that you love dearly, you don't want to do things that they hate. You want to do the things that actually please their hearts, the things that actually make them smile, the things that actually, that they love. And the thing is, is, Christ, when he came down and died for us on the cross, he brought us into that love relationship with God. Amen? Amen? So then in Jesus Christ, you and I, it is very possible for us to live in a manner that pleases the heart of God because in Jesus Christ, you and I, we are new creations. Amen? Amen? God wants to be in a love relationship with us. Yes? Are we all in agreement with that? Yeah, that's why he sent Jesus to die for us on the cross so that we can enter into this love relationship, this divine romance with God. So here's the thing. Shh, shh, shh. Listen. There's supposed to be a change in our mentality when you meet Christ and you enter into Christ and you begin to grow in Christ. There's supposed to be a change in our mentality. There's supposed to be a shift between, okay, here's what God doesn't like, and I keep doing these things, and I can't seem to get out of it. You don't have to think that way anymore because Christ came for you. And so now you and I no longer are here, but we are now here in a position that where God wants to be in a love relationship with us. So then you and I, the question that we should be asking in each day is, God, what can I do that will really please your heart? What can I do that will really bless you? What can I do that you love seeing me do? 
Like, how can I grow in that area? And so I have a contrast diagram, and I would like for you guys to flip the, the card to the back side, and I would like for you to write this diagram down. And so I try to look through the Bible of everything that God loves, that pleases God, that we could pursue, that we can think of and focus on and pursue. So rather than thinking about what God hates, that we can begin to focus on what does God love and how can I grow in that thing? What God loves, how can I grow in that in Jesus Christ? What is that area that God wants me to grow in? Um, and one of the leaders, they gave a suggestion is that between these two, it might be good for you guys to make a measure mark and to just say, man, between haughty eyes, like being arrogant and humility, like where am I? How does God want me to shift over from this side to this side through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ uh, so that I can live in a manner that actually pleases him and live in a manner that he loves? Uh, that he made us to live in, in and through his son, Jesus. There might be a number of you that are still living in fear. You're always constantly afraid of doing the things that God doesn't like. And you're like, oh, but I did this again. Oh, I did this again. Oh, I did. Uh, Jemmy, you no longer have to worry about that side. Jesus already came and died on the cross. He defeated sin for us. Amen? Amen? So in him, as long as we keep pursuing our relationship with him, you and I, we no longer have to think about what God hates, but now we can focus on, okay, God, what do you love? What can I do that really pleases your heart? How can I live that will really bless your name? What can I do that will really glorify you? Because it's possible now. I can do that. I don't have to focus on what God hates anymore. I can focus on what does God love and what does he want me to pursue so that I can live in a manner that really pleases him. Um, and I want to close with this passage and then we'll pray. If you guys will turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Paul gives us this charge. He says this, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Why? Because only those who seek after God's wisdom can carefully determine what pleases God's heart. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You and I, we can live pleasing God because of Jesus Christ. You and I, we just have to keep pursuing that, and we have to keep our focus on that. And this week, I would like for you guys to do that the best that you can, whether you're at school or at home or with your families for family day tomorrow. Think about Christ and ask God, God, what do you want me to focus on? in the area that pleases your heart.